Holy City Center Radio. This is episode number 44, and I am your host, Christian Sanger. Excited to be back for another week. I hope you've been enjoying the shows. I know I've been enjoying bringing them to you, and we have an incredible guest today. We're not going to mess around. We're going to get right into it. Uh, Today's guest is Mark Olshaker. He is an Emmy award-winning documentary filmmaker, journalist, and author of 12 nonfiction books and five novels. His books with famed criminal profiler John Douglas, beginning with Mindhunter and most recently The Killer's Shadow have sold millions of copies and have been translated into many languages. Today we'll mostly be discussing his book When a Killer Calls which recounts the horrific story of Sherry Smith uh, who was kidnapped from the driveway of her family's Lexington County home back in 1985. Her abductor then made repeated phone calls to her family taunting her mother and sister Uh, Unfortunately, Smith was found dead days later, and the crime spree continued shortly thereafter. Uh, The book details the crime itself and the work of police and the FBI to find her murderer and bring him to justice. It is an incredible book. Uh, I did read it. Um, It is... You know, obviously devastating to hear what this family went through, uh, reading about the the killer and, you know, what he did to them is it's just so sad, but uh, it makes for a good read. You know, uh, you're rooting for the police and the FBI to find this guy. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's a true crime story. You can easily look up, you know, the end result and everything that happened. But uh, we won't have too many spoilers or anything like that for those who are interested in reading the book. Uh, we're going to discuss the case and some other things involving um, his career and uh, working with John Douglas, um, who, uh, as I mentioned before, they both have, you know, they've partnered on many, many books, including Mindhunter, which was turned into a series on Netflix. Uh, you may have seen it. Uh, one of the characters is actually based on John Douglas. Uh, So we'll be talking to Mark about his work with John uh, and then, you know, from working with an FBI, uh, former FBI agent and what that whole process is like. It should be a really fascinating story and definitely go pick up the book. It's it's thrilling to read. Um, You you know, you forget sometimes it's nonfiction because it, you know, does sometimes sound like you're reading um, a fiction, you know, novel. And it's like a, you know, uh, whodunit trying to find the person uh, really interesting and and highly recommend it. And a quick note, be sure to stick around at the end of the interview because we are going to play a clip uh, from a call that the killer made to a local news reporter, so uh, be sure to stick around after the interview to hear that. So without any further ado, let's get into it. Here it is now, my interview with Mark Olshaker. Joining me now is Mark Olshaker, an Emmy award-winning documentary filmmaker, journalist, and author of 12 nonfiction books and five novels. He has written many books with famed criminal profiler John Douglas, beginning with Mindhunter and most recently The Killer's Shadow. They have sold millions of copies, incredible career that I can't wait to discuss, but we'll also be talking about When a Killer Calls, um, which I mentioned earlier involves a crime here in South Carolina. Mark, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Christian. So I guess the best part to start at is, you know, what led you to a career as a journalist and author and filmmaker? Was this something you always wanted to do or you were drawn to? Well, I guess going back to junior high and high school, I was always interested in the creative arts. And I thought about acting originally, but I didn't think I had any particular talent. (laughs) And uh, writing seemed to be – I had no musical ability whatsoever. (laughs) Uh, So um, writing seemed to be the thing that I could do the best. And I loved hearing stories and telling stories. And that's probably what you'll hear from from most writers. And uh, I guess when I got out of college, I – uh, I decided I would just jump in and see what I could do. I I worked some time as a filmmaker, uh, did public relations, I did journalism, all kinds of things, and gradually settled into documentary filmmaking and book writing. And I did both novels and nonfiction. And as a novelist, you're always interested in why do people do the things they do? Mm. What's, what's the mystery? What's 
what is it about the human condition that's so interesting and how does it fit into stories? And uh, so I'd written a number of uh, thriller novels, uh, kind of novels of intrigue, I guess you'd say, with some something of a scientific bent, beginning with Einstein's brain back when I was very young. And that, that did well, so I was, I was able to keep going. And I had uh, been working with NOVA, the PBS science series, uh, on a number of programs. And then... Like everybody else, uh, or almost everybody else, I read the novel of Silence of the Lambs, mm. and I said to the producer, uh, Nova, Paula Absell, up at WGBH in Boston, I said, uh, Paula, I- I've read this book. I understand it's going to become a film. If the film is anywhere near as good as the book, of course, I had no idea how well it would do. I said, I think it's going to be a big hit, and why don't we do a story? Why don't we do a film for Nova about the real people behind the uh, uh, this FBI profiling unit in Quantico, Virginia? And uh, the, the serial killers weren't yet a thing, and this was before 9-11, so security wasn't as tight. And so I called the FBI Academy, and they kind of welcomed me in, and uh, we started following this uh, uh profiling unit, which, which was then called the investigative support unit around. And I got to uh, know the uh, head of the unit, John Douglas, who was kind of legendary within the criminal justice uh, business and law enforcement business uh, because of his uh, his pioneering uh, profiling. And we did a film called uh, The Mind of a Serial Killer, which did very well on PBS. And then I would say, I don't know, some months after we finished, John called me and said, you know, I'm getting ready to retire. Do you think anybody would be interested in my career for a book? And I said, well, I certainly would. Um, let's let's see. And uh, probably the smartest thing I did, Christian, was come up with the name Mindhunter or the title <laughs> Mindhunter. And uh, we took it around in New York with my agent and uh, – we got some offers, and uh, so we wrote the book. Uh, it became a big bestseller, I, which I was great, and we just kept going from there. We we realized we had so many more stories to tell, and I think uh, when a killer calls is like our tenth book together now. Yeah, it's it's incredible what you guys have done together. And you mentioned you were interested in why do people do what they do? And I mean, exactly what yeah. better person to talk to than John Douglas being a criminal profiler. And that's exactly what he studies. Um, the, the perfect partnership. Yeah. And I think, you know, what we realized is, um, you know, and this gets into the whole issue of, of why do people – why are people so fascinated in true crime now? And, mm. and obviously I get asked that question a lot, and I've thought about it a lot, and I think the reason is because true crime really is about – the human condition that I mentioned, but the human condition writ large at the extremes. Uh, we all we all have these human emotions of love, hate, revenge, jealousy, resentment, uh, what uh, what have you. Uh, but the people that we write about act on them, and they have no uh, uh, they have no control. They have no well, they have some impulse control, but not much. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have no empathy for their fellow human being, and uh, so these are these are stories really about those extremes of human behavior. And one of the things we try very hard to do uh, is never. Uh, glamorize the offender in any way, and we always try to humanize the, uh, the the victims and their families and the people who seek justice for them. And you know, I think the reason you asked me on is because uh, our latest uh, book, When a Killer Calls, involves a case right there in Lexington, South Carolina, and uh, it it really is. Um, you know, if your bro- if your podcast is called Holy City Sinner. We've got plenty of each in this book. Uh, we've we've got an absolutely horrific uh, s- serial killer, somebody who would have gone on to kill many more people had he not been caught, and we have probably one of the most uh, moving stories of faith and courage from uh, from a victim and a victim's family that either John Douglas or I have ever encountered in the person of Sherry Faye Smith, who uh, one spring day in 1985 was abducted from in front of her uh, in front of her 
driveway uh, as she was get, getting out to get the mail two days before she was supposed to graduate from high school and uh, and sing the Star Spangled Banner at the at the graduation ceremony, and she was abducted. Um, she was, uh, and two days later, her family got a, uh, a letter in the mail uh, entitled "Last Will and Testament" that Sherry wrote, knowing that she was about to be murdered. And this letter is the most amazing uh, testament, I guess you would call it, to faith and courage and grace that. I certainly have ever seen. Um, and interestingly enough, if you read the book, it very much led to uh, to her killer's capture. But, uh, you know, this, this book, fortunately or unfortunately, has everything in it in terms of uh, heroism, in terms of showing how uh, the investigative process works, how profiling works, how it connects with both really good police work, which we had down in Lexington County, and um, uh, scientific evidence and uh, and forensic uh, processing. So, you know, that's the story. And uh, I think that it really is a story of uh, somebody who was very holy and somebody who was very much a sinner. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I definitely don't want to associate with that kind of sinning. That is for sure. <laughs> uh, mine's more tongue in cheek, of course. But uh, mm -hmm. no, it's it, like you said, the book has a, a, you know, a little bit of everything. And, and I, you touched on a lot of important things, uh, including, you know, yes, it does talk about the crime. And of course, it talks about the investigation and profiling. But as you mentioned, you also made sure uh, you and um, Mr. Douglas made sure to keep the focus on the victims and their family as much as possible. So I think that's always great with this true crime. Um, you know, the true crime's always been popular, but with the advent of podcasts and streaming services, it seems like it's reached another level. Um, and some people kind of, you know, criticize it for glorifying, but I think this book does an amazing job of not glorifying it and focusing on well, the victims. Well, thank you. And if anybody is to be glorified, it's the Smith family. And Absolutely. in this particular case, uh, Sherry, who was a beautiful blonde young lady, had an older sister named Dawn who, li who looked very much like her. And from the fact that – and another very unusual aspect of this case was that the abductor kept calling the Smith family. Uh, yes. And that's – and hence the title, When a Killer Calls. Um, and he was very smart about it in that he made sure this was before cell phones, of course. Uh, trap and trace devices on tele telephones were fairly primitive in those days. Uh, and he really made sure that he could never be caught uh, this way. But the, uh, but the behavioral indicators he gave away really helped John and the police to uh, to come up with a uh, to, to come up with a formula that would would and a strategy which would uh, help run him to ground and as I was saying dawn the older sister who looked very much um, like sherry uh, he, uh, from these phone calls, John could tell that the killer, the unsub, as we call him, the unknown subject, was very much uh, taken and uh, kind of obsessed with Dawn once he had killed Sherry. And uh, John, essentially, with the uh, with the family's uh, hesitant uh, agreement and Dawn's incredible courage, really used her as bait to bring the bring the killer out, and to a large extent, as you'll. See, you, one will see in the book, it succeeded. Oh, it, it's incredible what the entire family did, especially like you mentioned, Dawn and her mother, Hilda. It's incredible the bravery and, and what they had to go through. Um, it, it's it's crazy. People should definitely read it. And, you know, you mentioned the, the killer calling the family. And I was actually sent a clip of a call he made to the local news reporter. Um, and what struck me was how like calm and, and quote unquote normal he sounded, you know, I almost expected this like straight from the movies over the top, sinister, you know, growl or something. And it was basically the opposite, which was almost creepier that way. Um, Oh, it absolutely is. I, I completely agree with you, Christian. And uh, this is somebody who is in control, who is clearly enjoying what he's doing. Mm. I mean, he is, uh, he is almost p possessing Sherry and the family by, uh, by the way he talks to them and the way he leads them on, and even the way he describes uh, how, he, how he killed Sherry. And at the same time, looking for... Uh, 
I guess, looking for sympathy, looking for empathy, which is just is crazy in and of itself. But uh, and the most the scariest part of all was in one of the calls when he when he was talking to Don and Don, of course, was encouraged to keep talking to him to see if uh, they could keep him on long enough for the police to run the uh, telephone company tra- trap and trace. And at one point he said to, to Don, you know, it's only a matter of time. You can't you can't stay safe forever. God wants you to join Sherry Fay. And that is probably one of the most chilling things um, any of us have have ever heard uh, an unknown subject say. And uh, it also shows you know, that you, we, he... one one can only imagine. And uh, between what Sherry went through, knowing she was going to die, knowing her whole life ahead of her was being taken away from her by this malicious, evil, self-centered person, and what Dawn had to go through in terms of uh, the courage that it took to follow through with that. I mean, I I can only imagine. I think it would be very difficult for any of us. And I know you've talked to a lot of people involved in this kind of thing, Christian, and I think it would be very difficult for any of us to, to go through that ourselves. Oh, I couldn't even imagine. I, I just I, You try to put yourself in people's shoes when you see or read these stories, and it, you can't unless you've been through it. Yeah. it. I can't even imagine. And what you mentioned there where he you know threatened Dawn, the older sister, I mean, it goes to show mm-hmm. that this would have continued, and it did. There was another um, young yes. uh, girl who was abducted exactly. while they were trying to find him, and this would have it would not have stopped. No, um, several several days after the abduction and after they received this letter, the unsub called back and gave Dawn instructions to find uh, Sherry Sherry's body, which they did, and it been and he had withheld the information long enough and kept the body outdoors, you know, in the woods during the really hot uh, Midland summer to uh, so that the, the body was, was very difficult to get forensic clues off of. And then two weeks to the day, again, a Friday afternoon, two weeks to the day after he abducted Sherry Fay, he abducted uh, nine-year-old uh, Deborah May Helmick, not too far away from the trailer park in which uh, she and her family lived. And, you know, if you... It's perverse enough to kidnap and do whatever you did to a uh, to a 17 year old girl to a nine year old girl. Mm. It's just absolutely, you know, be, beyond description. And and to be honest, we don't really know what he did to her. But he also gave Dawn instructions several days later to find Deborah May's body. And you know, what you can we can only imagine. We don't, it's easy to imagine, in a way, what this must have done to each family, and mm-hmm. uh, and and it did. And uh, uh, so, as you say, at that point, uh, Sheriff James Metz, uh, under Sheriff Lou McCarty from Lexington County, they knew that they had to catch this guy because he was not going to stop on his own. And you know, we mentioned before they they search for him, and and then it comes down to without giving too too much away, you know, for the whole story. Even though I know this is you mm-hmm. know anybody could go look at this, and this is decades old. But um, you know, then the question becomes, you know, if if he's caught and brought to trial, there's going to be talks about his mental capacity and and how and mm-hmm. you guys discussed how the FBI profiling might differ, especially at that time, from the terms and things that a psychiatrist might say, you know, saying this person's out of their mind with this, that, and the other, doesn't mean that they aren't in control of their impulses or couldn't have stopped. So there's also interesting um, discussion of that later in the book about the differences between the two fields and, and trying to relay that these things seem so horrific to all of us that we think this person must be mentally ill. And to some capacity, they, they likely are. But is it to the point where they should be found not guilty by, like, insanity? And I think that was really interesting as well. Well, Christian, you're, you're doing all my work for me because you've, <laughs> you've, outli- you've outlined it perfectly. Uh, the question became at trial, and again, without giving too much away, uh, because we, I do hope it's an exciting, interesting story for people to read with a very strong what happens next uh, component to it. But when the um, when the unknown subject, whose name was Larry Jean Bell, uh, and many of your listeners, I'm sure, know that name from uh, from hearing the news stories or from their parents or grandparents even. Uh, once he was put on trial, the issue became somebody who did something this vicious, this bizarre, and 
his actions at the trial were so bizarre right. and so so narcissistic and all that. Can somebody like that be uh, be in his right mind? And the big struggle was to say, yes, he probably he he certainly has some mental illness. And I would I would submit that anybody who kills another human being in cold blood much less a 17-year-old girl or a 9-year-old girl, uh, totally innocent, uh, who he didn't even know. Yes, that person must have some kind of serious mental illness. But that's not really the issue in law. The issue in law, interestingly enough, goes all the way back to the 1700s and what's called the McNaughton Rule in, uh, in, in English common law, when a man named Daniel McNaughton tried to assassinate uh, Sir Robert Peel, the uh, the British Prime Minister, who also was the one who begun began the um, Metropolitan Police uh, Department, uh, one of the first major city police departments in the world, and hence the reason they're called both Bobbies and Peelers mm. because of Sir Robert Peel. But in any event, he tried to kill Sir Robert Peel. Daniel McNaughton did, and he ended up uh, he did not succeed, but he did kill. Uh, Peel's private secretary. And the question was whether he was in his right mind or not. And the test that was used, interestingly enough, was a, a sort of a two or three pronged text, test, which is, did he know the difference between right and wrong? Was he able to conform his behavior to the uh, dictates of society. And in the case of McNaughton, they said he wasn't, uh, and they confined him to uh, an insane asylum. But what's interesting is with there's there been all kinds of interpretations since then, but over these last 200, 250 years, the McNaughton rule still basically applies. Is this person able to conform his uh, behavior to the dictates of society? And does he know the difference between right and wrong? And I would submit to you, Christian, that in most of the uh, serial killers and uh, and violent predators that we've studied over the years, all almost all of them know the difference between right and wrong. They just don't care. It's not as important to them as fulfilling their own narcissistic, savage uh, desires. And the other person, the victim, is merely a prop to them. It's not a human being. They completely depersonalize this person. And we have, and I think you, you probably recognize it from the book, there's an old... Uh, a convention in law enforcement known as the policeman at the elbow, and that mm. states that if uh, if there if there was a uniformed police officer close by observing the uh, offender, would he still have committed the crime? And if the answer is yes, he probably is pretty far gone mentally. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. If no, then uh, he probably can conform his behavior to uh, the dictates of society, whether he wants to or not. Uh, and uh, and that's what we have in the case of Larry Jean Bell. Absolutely. You know, whether it's this case or some, I mean, almost all of these works that you've done with John Douglas and, and some of the documentaries, you've had to hear and see some pretty horrific things in studying these crimes. How do you compartmentalize that, not let it affect you too much, or, or, or does it? Well, it's very interesting. I mean, certainly it, it does. You can't, you can't help it. Um, my wife doesn't like me to talk about it in the evenings or at the dinner table, as, as you <laughs> might uh, <laughs> imagine, and, and neither neither does John's. Um, but uh, one of the things you, talk, you, you try to focus on the story and almost like a doctor examining a, uh, a disease or trying to figure it out. The mystery is what becomes compelling, and then when you get to the character level, the victims are so important to us that that's sort of what we focus on. And you know, it, it's the job of the uh, of the detective or the police officer or the uh, or the uh, prosecutor to get justice for the victims. And our contribution is to tell their story in a way that's uh, that makes sense, that shows them for what they really are, shows the other people for what they they are, and gives us some indication about uh, about human behavior. And as I say, this this case certainly does. Plus, it's a fascinating uh, treatise on how the various aspects of law enforcement, whether it be behavioral profiling really dogged police uh, and detective work, uh, forensic analysis, uh, 
uh, all of that uh, comes together. And without giving too much away, I'll just say that uh, both John's profile and the uh, and the physical document of the last will and testament came together to solve this case in a, in a very fascinating way, I think. Uh, and, you know, you mentioned trying to focus on the victims, and it's not just in your, yes. your books and, and your documentaries. You also are involved in victims' rights organizations, correct? Absolutely. Uh, we, we have, we've done a lot of work in that regard, and uh, I've spoken at a lot of uh, victim rights conferences, and we've advocated over the years very strongly in favor of victim impact statements, which are what the victim, uh, once there's a conviction, it's what the victim's family is uh, is allowed to give and speak before uh, the judge and the jury before sentencing. And some people say that this is not really fair, that it uh, creates an uneven playing field that uh, some victims might have a more sympathetic story and some uh, and some perpetrators may have a less sympathetic story and therefore uh, sentencing can be unequal and we object to that and what we say is once a cr- once a violent crime is committed the victim and the victim's family is put into a relationship that the offender creates. The offender creates a relationship. The victim doesn't want to be in it, but Mm. that's, it doesn't matter anymore because he or she often she is. And so we figure once that relationship is created, then both parties of the relationship have the right to be heard. And the criminal justice system is set up so that the, uh, so that the defendant can be heard, and we think it's only fair then that the uh, that the victim be heard, and that the sentence have something to do with the impact on the victim and the victim's family. And that's really the only way that some semblance of earthly justice can be obtained in a murder case. I mean, almost any other case, restorative justice in some form can work, but not in the case of murder. In the case of murder. I mean, how do you – I mean, yes, the the victim's family can forgive that person, but really no earthly justice can, uh, can, can, can create cosmic justice. I mean, any justice there's going to be really is in the next world and not, not something we can, we can deal with. Well said. And uh, the book is called When a Killer Calls. Uh, Mark, is there anything else about the case or the book you want to uh, mention that we didn't get to or, or direct people to learn more about your works? Uh, no, just that we're, that we're very grateful for all the help from the participants that we got. Uh, we, were, we were very grateful for uh, Dawn's, uh, Dawn's uh, participation and uh, cooperation with us. She's still around. She's still in your neck of the woods. She's a, uh, she is a gospel singer in South Carolina and uh, – I, I, her, her, her now name is Dawn Smith Jordan. Uh, her site is, I believe, Dawn Smith Jor- Dor- Jordan. Uh, uh, let's see, Dawn Smith Jordan Ministries uh, dot org, I believe, and uh, I, I commend you to her. Uh, but thank you. You've you've really hit on all the key points, uh, Christian, and it's it's a pleasure talking to you. Uh, it was uh, an honor to speak with you. I, I love your work. Uh, you do an amazing job, and this book is incredible. So thank you so much for taking some time to speak with me today. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much to Mark Olshaker. An awesome interview. And as promised, we're going to play that clip now of the uh, killer calling a local news reporter. Uh, It's a little difficult to tell who is who at first, but a couple seconds in, you'll be able to tell who is speaking. Um, And and just so you can get an idea of the things that Mark and I were discussing in terms of his voice, um, the way he's trying to control the conversation, um, and, and just you know how creepy it is. Uh, I mean, it, it is no matter what, but just I, like I said in the interview, I was expecting this over the top thing. And well, you'll see, he just sounds like a regular, 
a guy who could live next door just calling. But at the same time, because you know the background, you're going to pick up on some things. Uh, you'll notice in the clip he also mentions turning himself in. He did not turn himself in at any point. Uh, the book also discusses how he said that to the family um, as well. And he, and as I mentioned, he did not turn himself in. So I just wanted to uh, add that note um, and also let you know it's just a, a clip. It's not the full phone call. Uh, so it does cut off at one point. But we want to give you an idea of, you know, this person and, and, and the call we were talking about during the interview. So uh, here it is now. And trace or tap if it is a hang up. No, okay. I don't have the ability okay. to do that. All right, this is concerning Sherry B. Smith. Uh -huh. And I'm going to use you as a medium. Can you handle it? Uh -huh. Okay, now listen carefully. Uh -huh. um, I can't live with myself, Charlie, and I need to turn myself in, and I'm afraid. Uh -huh. And you're a very intelligent person, and I want you to be there with Sheriff Smith and all officers he wants. And, uh, at his home in the morning at 6 a.m. and you answer the phone. At whose home? At Sheriff Matt's home. Uh, All right, now, don't answer any questions unless I ask yes or no. Uh, ask, uh, you be there and you answer the phone, and his phone, home phone is 356-2118. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, verify that when you report tonight on Channel 10 TV at 7, because I want to make sure this is not a hoax call, and I'll prove it to you by, after I finish talking, you call Sheriff Metz and talk to him directly and tell him that he received a letter from Sherry. And that is it, my interview with Mark Olshaker. I want to thank him so much for coming on. What um, a treat it was to speak with him about his career um, and this uh, book in particular. Again, it's called When a Killer Calls. You can pick it up, I mean, at this point, anywhere that you can find books. If you can find it locally, you know, from a local bookshop, you know, like Itinerant Literate over in uh, Park Circle, Buxton Books downtown, or uh, Blue Bicycle Books, any of those types of places, you know, obviously we recommend that. But if not, it's available everywhere else. Um, really thrilling stuff. And uh, I'm sure after hearing that interview, you all are very interested to read it as well. That's it for this week. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, we'll be back a little later this week with a bonus episode, so uh, be sure to subscribe if you haven't. Um, you can also like and rate the podcast, which I'd really, really appreciate, um, and spread the word. You can also go to patreon.com slash holycitysinner to support the work we do here on the podcast as well as the website and everything else involving Holy City Center. You can also pick up merchandise, holycitycenter.com slash shop to pick up hats, stickers, you name it. It's on there and uh it you know uh, just any way you can help out is always appreciated even if it's just likes and retweets and all that good stuff on social media uh thank you to Lindsay marie collins of lmc sound system and fmb radio an awesome local podcast she produces each and every episode and thanks to tyler boone for providing the music for every episode as well and thank you to all of you for listening um Appreciate you checking in every week and, and can't wait to bring more fun interviews to you as we move forward. So for now, good night and good luck.